Easter and we're reflecting on all that this time of year brings to our remembrance about what Jesus did for us. I was reading Ephesians this week and I just want to read it over you. Father, we just, we just um, quieten our hearts before you. We're so privileged to be meeting together as your people in this place. And we give to you all of the things, the concerns of our hearts, the things that are troubling us, whether it be in the physically or emotionally. Father, we give all of those things to you and we set our gaze upon you. We turn our hearts and our affections towards you. So I'm just going to read Ephesians. This was from Paul. And he says, my name is Paul, and I was chosen by God to be an apostle of Jesus, the Messiah. And I'm writing this letter to all the devoted believers who have been made holy by being made, being one with Jesus, the anointed one. I'll just read that again. To all the devoted believers who have been made holy by being one with Jesus, the anointed one. May God himself, the heavenly father of our Lord Jesus Christ, release grace over you and impart total well-being into your lives. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderful Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus, all because he sees us wrapped up in Christ. This is why we celebrate him with all our hearts. And he chose us, he chose us to be his very own, joining us to himself even before he laid the foundation of the world, of the universe Because of his great love, he ordained us, he marked us with his love, setting us apart so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with unstained innocence. For it was always, it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us, to establish us as his delightful children through our union with Jesus, the anointed one, so that his tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify his grace. For the same love that he has for his beloved one, Jesus, he has for us. Did you hear that? For the same love he has for his beloved one, Jesus, he has for us. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. Since we are now joined to Christ, we have been given the treasures of redemption by his blood, the total cancellation of our sins, set free from bondage, all because of the cascading riches of his grace. This superabundant grace is already powerfully working within us. Hallelujah, hey? That's amazing. Releasing within us all forms of wisdom and practical understanding. Let's celebrate the let's let's just in, encourage I encourage you to just celebrate the one Because this is amazing grace, isn't it? This is amazing. We did not deserve it. But he has set his love upon us and we get to respond to him. Let's respond.
Uh, I'm not Tony, but I'm filling in for Tony. Uh, oh. Uh, my mind. It's not. My shirt is not loud enough. I was tempted to go out and get a. <laughs> oh, why am I here? Um, please, <laughs> please join us for a cup of tea after the service. You're very welcome for a cup of tea or coffee and some biscuits. Um, from the bulletin, uh, the mission support committee meeting has been rescheduled. So ordinarily, it would have been on uh, this coming Monday but it's been postponed until Tuesday the 19th so that it's after the school holidays. Uh, so it's um, at 1pm in the Oasis room for anyone who's interested in coming along. Uh, good morning, Gwen. Uh, we still uh, possibly need cleaners. We might have one option, but uh, we still... If you know of anybody who might be interested in um, doing some volunteer hours, please see me or Reese or any of the... Um, diaconate and um, talk to them about uh, what that involves. Uh, Gwen is looking for meals still for Gary and Leah. Oh, she's got enough. Okay, Gwen's got enough meals. Um, and I'm still working on the directory. So if you're new to church or you need your details updated or a new photo, uh, just see me after church. Oh, Oh, whoopsie, yes, and the Good Friday service is 8 a.m., not p.m., as the bulletin says. Sorry, whoops, lol. <laughs> um, oh, um, tithes and offerings. Uh, this is a, a, an opportunity for us to give back to the Lord a little bit of the goodness that he extends to us. So um, the details will appear on the screen for those people watching at home and um, everyone else you know, you've got the details, so thank you for that. Um, family news, we have uh, Jeff Smith, who's um, got a bit of a medical thing happening on Tuesday, so keep him in your thoughts. Uh, Jack Pantlin is recovering in St Stephen's Hospital, and while um, having visitors is quite limited, he's um, very happy to receive phone calls, so if you want to give Jack a call um, at St Stephen's, I guess you just call their main line and then ask to be put through. Oh, and Gwen's got his number for anyone that wants it. Um, uh, Bev and Robin are both a little bit unwell today and Robin thinks she might have to have some sort of uh, surgery on her shoulder at some point in the future, so keep her in your thoughts. And, yeah, and uh, I'll just uh, welcome you to join me in a time of prayer. So... Um, Father, we just thank you for all of these beautiful people. Um, we thank you for Jeff and for Jack and for Bev and for Robin, Lord, and we bring before you any other people who have need of prayer this morning, Lord. And we just, we thank you for your graciousness that you extend to us, Lord. Father, we think of those in the Ukraine, Lord, and in Russia who are suffering, Lord, we think of uh, people who are still in floods or recovering from floods across the whole south coast, I mean, the east coast of Australia, Lord. Um, it just baffles the mind to think of the, the chaos and the, the clean-up and, and the heartbreak that those people are going through, Lord. So we just bring them before you, Lord, and we trust you to um, love them and look after them in this time. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, um, church family. Um, I'm on Mission Spot today. This is my first time on Mission Spot. <coughs> and today we're thinking about Carl and Gail Mush. I think that's how we pronounce it. M-U-S-C-H. Has anybody met them? That, uh, yes, so... Um, Carl sent me a nice long letter and with some photos, which is going to be on the board over there. Don't forget, we've got Mission Corner over there. Um, so anyone who wants to take it home and read it all. But just some special points. Um, they work... We've got Carl up there. Good. They're working with the Aboriginals. 
I'm just looking to see what they've got up there. Right. So, IMLA, Indigenous Ministry Links Australia. And so, um, he's very, been very busy. Um, Darwin on the 6th of April. Uh, so that's just a few days ago, isn't it? And then um, Catherine on the 7th and the BESIC planning meeting on the 8th and then Tennant Creek on the, from the 9th to the 15th. Um, and then um, he goes to uh, Uindamu on the 17th and a question mark about Alice Springs for the 20th, 19th to the 22nd. Um, and then on the 22nd, he's written, I hope to fly to Brisbane to meet up with my two daughters who will be at a Gold Coast ministry conference and over the rest of the week, week, week meet with some Southeast Queensland ministry partners. So as you can see, he's very, very busy. Um, and then later in June, they'll have these Beswick revival meetings and the conference. And then just another up, up ahead in August, we could pray about this. The younger daughter, Joy, who is in charge of children's ministry in a church on the Gold Coast, is getting married. And so we need to pray for that couple. And then we're planning a Northern, Terri Northern Youth yeah, Regional Greeting Gathering for a week in early October. So Carl and... Gail, his wife, um, she works, I think she may be a school teacher or something because he said something about spending some time with her while she's on holidays. <laughs> so I, I don't know how they fit it all in. But we need to pray for them. They certainly um, have other plans for uh, various things too. And um, the, so they work amongst the Aboriginal folk in all these different places. Um, and so you can have a look at these later. And we've got a good photo of them up there because I've got a photograph of them here where Carl is standing behind Gail and I can't really see him. <laughs> so let's pray for these missionaries that we help support. Oh, and don't forget there's mission envelopes, mission offering envelopes around. So um, if you feel led to give some to the support of our missionaries, and then put it in our boxes. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for missionaries. We thank you for Carl and Gail and their family, especially today, and pray your blessing on them and for your leading for the um, people that they serve with, Lord. We thank you for our Aboriginal Christians and we ask your blessing on all of them this day who will be meeting in various places just like we are. We pray that you will guide and lead and be especially with Carl and Gail and their family as they serve you. Provide for their needs, Lord, in all their travels and driving long distances. Lord, we do ask that you will bless this family and that they will know that we Love them and care for them and support them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to hear of the kingdom of God being established in other places as well, isn't it? Let's just continue to worship God.
the king of my heart be the mountain where i run the fountain i drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where i hide the and for my life oh he is my song you are You are
Well, good morning. How are we doing? Good to see y'all. And our online family, good day. Um, this week, or last week, we concluded our uh, Renewal in the Kingdom of God series, looking at the clash between two kingdoms. And, and this week, in some respects, tracks on a little from that as we come to the story of, of Palm Sunday. I, I don't know about you, but I've really wondered uh, around this incredible event where Jesus is celebrated as uh, coming into Jerusalem as their, their, their Messiah, the son of David, Hosanna, praise be to the name of Yahweh. And there's these massive messianic declarations that are going on. So here he is coming in to Jerusalem as a hero. The people are turning out. They're laying their cloaks down, the palm leaves down, and he goes from hero to zero in a week. How does that work? What actually happened? Why? Why? How did that work? And when we start to look at the clash of two kingdoms, the, the, and if you have a look at the, the final week of Jesus' life, which is called these days Holy Week, and, and I would encourage us this week that we spend some time in Mark's Gospel from chapter 11 and following, and, and we look at, at who Jesus was talking to and what their story was and the story that Jesus responds to their story with, you'll start to see why they treated him the way they did because he did not affirm their stories. Because the fact of the matter is the world is formed by stories. The world runs on stories. Some stories have got the power to heal and transform, while other stories cause destruction and harm. You've heard me say previously that the church is a story-formed community. We have a, a magnificent story that forms and shapes us as a people. And I think that particularly this Easter, but every Every Easter, I think we would agree that our world needs good news stories, doesn't it? So let's revisit the Palm Sunday story as a beginning point to the rest of what, fold, what unfolded in that final week of Jesus' life here on earth. From Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there. That's a, a donkey that has not been ridden. Well, that's what it says. No one's ever ridden it. Untie it, bring it here, and if anyone asks you why you're doing this, say the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the ground, while others spread their branches they cut in the fields. Those who went ahead of them who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went out into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Since it was already late, for what? Hmm. Interesting. He went out with Bethany, went out to Bethany with the twelve. When we start to to look at the nature of story, 
The, the fact of the matter is um, every story, or at least society's story, has three elements that, that are shaped around a central idea. Um, and so I've represented these three elements with three intersecting circles. And the, the first circle is around what is it that brings us safety and security? The second circle is around equality. How is it that we ensure others are looked after? And then finally, in the third circle, is about the idea of prosperity. What do we think is going to make us successful? So these three things are formed around a framing story that holds those three ideas together. So most societies have these kinds of elements that shape them as a people group, that shape their culture, it was no different in Israel's time. And there are only a handful, literally a handful, of shaping, framing stories. The first story is the empire story of domination. It's the domination it's the empire. It's, it's the, the idea that says we're in charge here. And it's when you talk about safety and security, it's submit to us and you'll have peace. When we start to think about equality, um, how others are looked after, well, equality, you're not our equals but do as we say and we'll get along just fine. And when you start to think about prosperity, how, how do we engage success together? Well, in this story, um, the, the idea, it's the equality is my way or the highway. The prosperity is give me your power and uh, I'll make sure you looked after. But what am I, what's up, Josh? Okay. Not on. Oh, well, we'll, we'll keep having a go. Thanks, Josh. Very, very good. Um, so, so we've got these, these three ideas, um, of safety and security, equity, prosperity. Th this is a very, should be a familiar framework for us to think in because it's the story of the US or the story of Russia in Ukraine. It's the story of China. It's the, we're the big boys in town. We have the power here. We will tell you how it is. And if you don't, do not submit to us, We'll give it to you in the neck. So if everyone does what we say and thinks what we think, then everything's going to be right and the world will be a better place. You're either with us or you're against us. And there's a, a price. We've heard it said every Anzac Day, a price of freedom. And it usually always involves violence and or sacrifice. History is full of domination stories being played out. The Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Romans. The Roman Empire was the imperial or the domination background of the New Testament story. People understood what it meant for the Romans to have power over every aspect of a person's life. Power and violence brought peace and security. People submitted to Pilate, not because they liked or loved him, but simply he was the power. Caesar was often talked about being the people's saviour or a liberating king, yet the Messiah is the Jewish word for saviour. Christ means liberating king. Jesus was called the Christ, not because that was his name, but rather he is the liberating king. 
Maybe we should call him Jesus the Liberator. (laughs) So that we get a sense that Christ is not a title. Sorry, a title. It's not his surname. So the Jews didn't want to be part of the domination story of others. They desired the right to self-determination, which leads us to the next story. And the next story is the victim story, which is the story of the oppressed. This is the promise that peace and security will come through the violent overthrow of the oppressors. So equality is measured by commitment to the cause. It's a, you're with us or against us, but with a twist. And prosperity, well, that's all about revolution. It'll be fine when we get these dirty, rotten, Gentile Romans out of here. It'll be fine if we can sort out the, uh, the Tutsis and get rid of them. It'll be fine if we, if we get rid of these Jews in World War II, the death camps of Auschwitz and others. Rwanda, where the, the fundamentalist groups came through. Well, actually, I'm sorry, I'm jumping into the shame blame story. But this, this story is very much the story of the Jews, but it's also very much the story of ISIS and the Taliban, where they, they're upset with Western oppression. And many Jews operated out of this story. They never forgot what happened 167 to 160 BC between the Jews and the Seleucids when Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, he comes in, he, he boils a pig in the laver in the temple, desecrating it, and tips it over in the temple. that we can't forget our past and how we've been mistreated we have to fight back now terrorism might seem like a fairly new idea to us but it's been around for a very 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 long time i mean the zealots in jesus day they practiced terrorism they carried long sakari knives very cur- curved long sakari knives they were called sakari men and they sneakily attacked Romans whenever they could. They disagreed with the oppressors, and they believed the gulf between Roman and Jew could only be overcome by violence. So there's this unbridgeable uh, division between them and us. Uh, They've died, have they, Chris? Okay. Cheers. Yeah, no worries. So there's this domination narrative there's there's actually the victim narrative and in both stories violence is the answer so the next story is the shame and blame story this is the purity narrative that says that everything that is wrong presently is the is the caused by someone someone's to blame someone's to blame for this and usually Usually, the blame is extended to a marginal group with no voice or power. So, peace and security is extended by scapegoating and exclusion. So, there's equality, and equality is all about conditional acceptance, not unconditional. So long as you look like us, dress like us, speak like us, are like us, you're in. So it's all conditional and prosperity is established through the purity code of belonging. And that's where we get the German atrocities of World War II and, and that the Hutu extremists that killed a, they killed a million, a million Tutsis and moderate Hutus in a hundred days. Unbelievable. Religious leaders blamed the September 11 attacks on the the two towers, the impure of their nation. 
and the locking out of prayer in schools. That all of our problems are somebody else's fault. The shame blame story was passed on by the Pharisees. It was all them prostitutes, tax collectors and sinners who held back God's blessing. And if we can get rid of them, prosperity will be restored. So it's this idea. But then the next narrative that there is, is the prosperity story. And this is a story that drives a lot of people, particularly in Australia. You'll hear it in that, I understand that Mr. Morrison is going to the governor to announce an election. You can guarantee one of the, one of the repeated phrases is going to be a healthy economy. I can just hear it and I'm sick of it already. And anyway, but it's the promise that peace and security comes by participating in a healthy economy. E equity and equality is measured by wealth. You've got to have a certain amount of dollars to pay the bills and get by. Prosperity is around the end justifies the means. And can, can you see Jesus agreeing with any of these? Can, can you actually see why they had problems with him? Because the trouble is, in particularly the West, many people have got a dual story in this system that marry religion and economics. If you do these things, God will do these things and make you rich. And at its core, it's, the, it's money that makes the world go round. I hope we're not saying that. I think it's love that makes... But anyway, I won't tip my hand too much. But in, in this idea that the end justifies the means, well, let's eat, drink and be merry because I'm making money out of you. The prosperity story is seen in the Sadducees who were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. There was nothing to look forward to. The Herodians, the tax collectors, and the stewards who played the Romans for their own political gain. These were Jews that gained from Roman oppression. They believed in the power of status and money. They, they understood that the Romans taxed everyone that they conquered. And the poor weren't always able to pay. The only thing they owned were la was land through family inheritance. And the wealthy came along and said, well, we'll pay your taxes, but in return, give us deeds for your land where you can live, but you'll now work for us. And the story of the rich young ruler, the poor saw these people as those who took advantage of them and hated them. The rich young ruler appears a few times in the gospel. I mean, how does a rich young Jew get wealthy under Roman oppression. How does that happen? And it can only be through collaboration with the Roman authorities. Hypocrisy. Religion gives the right to prosper. Hello. Oh, another one. All right, we'll have another go at that. Okay, Chris. Yeah, having a great morning with technology this morning, don't we love it? All right. So the, 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 the final narrative of, of the five is the isolation or the elite story. And this is where, where you've got peace and security through withdrawing from a corrupt system. And uh, in, in terms of equality, well... You've got the idea that let's circle the wagons. Let's not worry so much about equality. We're all in the same boat together. Uh, we'll just circle the wagons and fight off the bad guy and wait for rescue. And the idea of prosperity, not so important either. Who cares? So long as we survive. And this is a predominant narrative for many religious people who are waiting for the airlift, the rapture. The world's going to hell in a handbasket and the people as well. Jesus, come, Maranatha, get us out of here. Only the elite 
will be rescued and saved. And we can see that in various groups that operate from this story. They might form an enclave in a city. Gated communities are all the rage to keep the unclean and the orthodox out. I mean, we don't hear much about the elite isolation story directly in the Bible, but there's lots of archaeological evidence for them around the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Essene community. People who withdrew to the desert and didn't want to have anything to do with the rest of society. There's no hope, so we'll withdraw and form our own culture and we'll wait for the final scene to occur. And theirs was the power of discrimination. Now, all of these stories were at work and active during Jesus' day. And if you read from Mark chapter 11 and onwards with this, these frameworks in mind, and you see the, the chief priests coming to Jesus who considered themselves the dominant influence, well, in the Jewish world they were, but saying to Jesus, so what's your story? And Jesus said, well, hang on a minute. Just a second, you tell me your story, I'll tell you my story. And they didn't. And then you've got the Pharisees coming with the, the, the coin. Who do we pay taxes to? What's your story on the law? And Jesus says, well, it's not love of the law, it's the law of love. And then it's the Sadducees, the, the Herodians, the stewards coming to Jesus saying, what's your store on relationships and wealth? Because it was, wealth was not just about money, but their place in system and relationship. And whose wife will she be? And Jesus says, no, nah, no, nah, terribly sorry. God is not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. And at each point, Jesus is undermining their story and their standing. If you look at the, those few chapters with this grid and see what you see now. I was talking to Albert at the start of the service and Albert was saying, oh, you know how he, he now sees things in the scriptures that he didn't see years ago when he first started to read the scriptures for himself. And it's pretty much like that for all of us. Because each one of us is shaped by one of these stories or another. And, and we read it and we say, oh yeah, this is what the Bible says. But eventually we learn to ask the question, what does the Bible mean? And then as Jesus' story becomes more of, we become more of his story, we start to see things differently. Rather than through the lens of our own filter and preference and prejudice, we actually begin to see a different story. So when we read these, these amazing encounters, we read them with, out of a different foundation. Because Jesus' story is different. Jesus' story is the story of the kingdom of God. And it's an alternative to these other five framing narratives. Peace and security is established by forgiveness and grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you breathe? I, I don't know about you, but I struggled breathing through those first five. I had to get there to get here. But oh, whew, you can breathe forgiveness and grace because quite frankly in those other stories I just don't measure up at all I got no hope no standing no capacity peace and security by forgiveness and grace the equity circle ensures others are looked after through the love of the other love limited only by honor and respect And prosperity, well, prosperity is actually counterintuitive because we find ourselves as we give ourselves away. The first will be last, the last will be first. There's this idea that humility and selflessness is the way of the kingdom. We find ourselves in giving ourselves to others. It's the way of the kingdom. The kingdom story 
and the kingdom way is radically different from the elements of those days and many of our day. But sadly, while the crowds turned out to welcome Jesus and celebrate him as their long-awaited Messiah, they tried to fit him inside of their story. And here is a profound truth for us who follow Jesus. Because if we don't understand the stories that we have lived in, we will perpetuate a gospel that tries to fit Jesus inside a story that is not a kingdom story. You see, the gospel calls us to deeply consider and ask ourselves, are we following the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated or have we just bought into a gospel of personal salvation with a ticket to heaven in the context of our own story? What is it? What's our story? Jesus didn't proclaim another religion just to get us saved. He proclaimed and demonstrated a complete other kingdom because Jesus understood if you could change the story you can change the world we've talked long and hard about the nature of the kingdom of God over the last eight weeks in our last series hopefully we now understand that the kingdom of God is an interactive network of relationships between the king and others And we enter his kingdom through repentance, which is metanoia, transformed, transform the way we think. And it's a call to rethink everything and believe the good news. Living in the kingdom of God is a new way of living. A new arrangement, a new story is at hand. You don't have to wait Jesus said the kingdom has come near in time and space. In fact, we can now reach out and touch it now. Let's face it, I I think all of us would agree that someday the poor should be helped, the rich should be generous, racism should end, Refugees should be included, the environment should be cared for, and wars should cease. I think we'd all, wouldn't we all say amen, would we all say amen to that, would we? I think we'd all say amen to that, I think. Well, Jesus made that day this day. Jesus made that day this day. The good news is we can live this new way now, in freedom now, even before everything is right, Jesus says, I've got good news for you. You can live in this new hope right now. This is the message of Palm Sunday, the message of hope, the promise of hope. And the people cheered and laid down branches, but they didn't get it. And I have to confess, there are times where I struggle too as well. Because the old stories hang around, don't they? They hang around. And the problem in all of that is the vision we have of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but more and more I'm so dissatisfied with some of those visions of Jesus that I've been given. The empire Jesus, the dominant Jesus... The, the German chancellor at the, at the beginning of the 20th century who said, colonized by the Bible and the gun. I don't like that Jesus. But then we've got the victim Jesus who plans revenge on his enemies. I mean, when we're in power, we often want the domination Jesus. But when we're the victim, it's then Jesus in revenge mode. He'll be back. And he'll make sure the baddies get what they deserve. But sadly, we're saying that violence is the only way anything can really be achieved. I just don't understand why Christians buy into this. 
But these are the Jesuses that we're told that he is like. Revelation 19 and 20 talk about a Jesus who returns with a sword to fight back. Now, it's a small detail, but the sword is not in his hand. It comes from his mouth. And Jesus proclaimed the power of love, not the love of power. In our society, we find the other Jesuses, the shame, blame, Je- sorry about the typo, the, the, the uh, Sahay, the Sahay and blame, Sahay, sorry, the shame, blame Jesus that excludes and frightens the impure, the prosperity Jesus. Well, you know, you give one, you'll give you 10 back. It's all about, it's all about getting rich in the here and now. Gee, I could tell you some stories about that. Jesus is only interested in our wealth and well-being, and he's the predominant Jesus of many Australian Christians. Or it's the elitist Jesus. Let's set up the ghetto. We'll only use Christian businesses. We'll only send our kids to Christian schools. It's all got to be Christian this, Christian that, Christian the other. We're not going to give our money to them pagans. Oh, spare me. promotes a warehouse mentality. There are good, godly business people who just don't know it yet. And the only way they're going to know it is as we deal with them and they see something different about how we conduct ourselves. You know, having had a number of years in the motor trade and having having people drive up to my dealership with a fish sticker on the back of their car and having other car car sales consultants run for the hills and they'd run past my desk and they'd say, this is one of your mob, you deal with them. They were afraid. And so I would sit down with people with my sales book and I would do an open book disclosure and I'd say, now this is my buy price, here's the re- but this is my buy price, this is my pre-delivery price, this is the registration price, these costs are fixed, I can't do anything about them, you go to any dealership in Brisbane, you will get these prices. Now the question is, how much commission would you contribute to me to help you make this twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 purchase so that I can pay my telephone bill and put food on the table for my wife. Would you, would you say $20? Would you say $50? Maybe you would be generous and say $100. And I'd, whatever that figure was, I'd write it down and say, you can buy that car here for that amount of money and they would walk out and go down to burn forward down the street and shop me out for that amount of money that they said they would pay me to help them. My God is a God of abundance. He is a God of plenty, not just a good deal. He is the God of plenty. Why do we make God out to be a Scrooge? Why do we do that? I'm sure, Anne, it would be the same for you at Vinnie's where people come in trying to, oh, this is gifted to you. What are you doing putting this much money on it? I say, hang on a minute. Our God is a God of plenty, a God of abundance. How can my God bless you? I mean, let's remember that this guy who arrived in Jerusalem on that day came on the colt of a donkey with a message of peace and that his peace wins out over all other violence. And I hope we are more interested in this radical, undomesticated Jesus of that first Palm Sunday than one of these other guys that I don't recognize. 
He is the Jesus who proclaimed love, who extended grace and forgiveness, who offered himself in humble service to all as an expression of the kingdom of God. The promise, hope for all. So I hope this week, in Holy Week, as you read through these few chapters, story by story, day by day, that this framework of story, of looking at who Jesus was talking to, how he engaged them, and understanding some of the why, it will help you deeply appreciate what we're going to gather on Friday to celebrate. And then afterwards... I'm going to talk to Shannon and Marilyn about grabbing some hot cross buns and some butter, lashings of butter with hot cross buns that we can treasure as a community the life that was poured out in death to bring us life because this is the crowning glory of his story. So to reflect this morning, what stories shape your life? What are they? And are there any clashes? Because there are clashes, all of us. It's not one of us that doesn't have clashes around some of this stuff. And what will it, what will it look like for you to rethink your story? Where does mercy, compassion, justice and loving kindness and faithfulness need to work its way out in your story. And finally, yeah, we know what the Bible says, but what does it mean? And what will it mean for you, for me, for us to do life differently? What will it mean? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it, it is a mystery to me about the, the celebration that welcomed you in to Jerusalem and the trauma that you experienced a week later. You knew it was going to be like that and yet you did it anyway. But on this Palm Sunday, it is the promised hope of a new story and there are so many in our country and in the influence of our country that desperately need to find the hope of a new story and particularly today. I know that there are, there'll be tens of thousands of people turning out all over our nation to, to lobby the government to protest the treatment of refugees who are so desperately looking for a new story, a new home a new way of being. But Father, may we realise too that this world is not my home, that we're just passing through. If heaven's not our home, dear Lord, what would we do? But yet we can see heaven on earth in the here and now. Help us, Father, as we reflect on the events of Holy Week this week with this understanding, the prosperity, the, the, the dominant narrative, the victim narrative, the blame and shame narrative, the prosperity narrative, the elitist narrative. Help us to put these things in their right place and perspective that as we come to Good Friday, Easter Sunday, that we might grow in our understanding and appreciation of all that you are and of all that you have accomplished for us and for others. In the glory of the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Happy to chat with anybody afterwards, as always, but I'm going to invite Sharon and the team to come back to close our service with Jesus paid it all. Child of 
I trust that the truth of this cuts through, the promise of this cuts through all of the other stories, all of the other visions of Jesus to enable us to clearly know and understand this Jesus, who it is that we follow for the blessing of each of us. Thanks so much for joining us this morning to our online family. It's been great to have you with us as well. Please join us. No hot cross buns and lessings of butter today. You have to wait until Friday for that. But join us on Friday and as we go into the next step of our Easter celebration this year. Because Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all.